immigration, obviously, for national conservatism is one of the most important, if not the most important issue. But the problem is much of the discussion of the issue continues to focus on illegal immigration and not legal immigration. And right now that makes perfect sense given what a disaster we're seeing at the border. And this is an essential issue and Brandon's going to be talking about it. I'll be the first one to say it. Let's go, Brandon. So, um, um, but um, it doesn't really matter if you're enforcing the rules if the rules themselves aren't what they should be. And this is what I want to talk about is what immigration policy should be because enforcing the border is not immigration policy. Enforcing the border is like pre-immigration policy. In other words, so what do you want, a cookie for enforcing the border? Uh, that's, that should go without saying. The question is, who do we let into our country and how do we decide and how do we pick them and what have you? I mean, that's the important question. The old dodge that Republican politicians used and often still use is the legal good, illegal bad dodge. Uh, you know, it'd be fine is, except that people are breaking the law. But, you know, if illegality were the only problem, then the libertarian approach of just letting everybody in legally uh, would be fine. I was, how can you argue against libertarians who literally want open borders or maybe, you know, more accurately unlimited immigration um, if you don't have some conception of what immigration policy should be? And we're taking in 1.1 million legal immigrants every year in a whole variety alphabet soup um, of different categories. And the question is, you know, is that good? I mean, is that the best, I, sort of the best of all possible immigration policies? And my contention is no. Numbers need to come down. It's not, it's partly a question of legality. Obviously, the immigration laws should be enforced. But numbers need to be reduced. And there are lots of concerns that people have with immigration numbers. There are people who are worried about security issues. Others worried about assimilation. Others worried about the effect on the labor market, low-skilled workers. Others worried about the welfare impact. My contention is those are all the same thing. Those are all different facets of the same problem. In effect, we're all blind men touching different parts of the elephant, as the story goes, and thinking we're touching different things. One blind man grabs the tail and thinks he has a broom in his hand. The other bumps up against a foot and thinks it's a tree. It's all the same elephant. And the elephant is that mass immigration is incompatible with the goals and characteristics of a modern society in a way that wasn't necessarily true a century or two or three centuries ago. Modern society is qualitatively different from anything that's existed in the past. And that makes the mass admission of uh, people from abroad much more problematic than it ever was in the past. And the key thing here is that the immigrants aren't the issue. Today's immigrants aren't really all that different from immigrants of a century or two centuries ago. Yes, most of them come from different countries, but it's not that different. They're similar people in the sense that they're not the poorest of the poor and they're not rich people, they're usually poorer, poor-ish people, a couple steps up from the bottom, because you have to be able to rub a couple nickels together to get here. Maybe people with a little extra get up and go. Um, but that describes immigrants from the 1920s and from the 1840s, as well as from today. What's different is us. Our society has changed fundamentally in good ways and bad ways, but changed in ways that essentially mean that we have outgrown mass immigration. The image I use, and I had this in the introduction um, of the, the manuscript of the introduction of my book, a 2008 book, The New Case Against Immigration, Both Legal and Illegal. It's in the digital remainder bin at Amazon, if anybody can find used copies of it. Penguin was so embarrassed by it, they, um, they took it out of print. But the, in, the manuscript I submitted, uh, I used an image that my editor made me take out so I always bring it up when I talk about the issue, just to get back at Bernadette. This is for you, Bernadette, if you're watching this. <laughs> Immigration is like donuts. When you're seven years old, donuts are good for you. 
You need the fat, you need the calories, you need the sugar. When you're 57 years old, you can't eat donuts the same way. Now, some of us do eat donuts maybe the same way, but we shouldn't. It's the same donuts. Nothing's wrong with them, nothing's changed. Maybe they're crullers instead of jelly donuts, but it's still donuts. And you, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not sick, you're not broken. Your metabolism has changed. And modernity changes the metabolism of the body politics such that mass immigration is problematic in a way that it wasn't before. It was always problematic to some degree. It was always disruptive and convulsive to some degree, but we could cope with it much more successfully, the problems of it, in the past than we can today. And let me just go over a couple of the ways that's true. Um, economics. We have a post-industrial knowledge-based economy. Uh, our, we have a very small share of our workforce that works in agriculture, obviously, and frankly, not all that big a share that works in manufacturing. And even if Senator Hawley's image of reshoring manufacturing were to come about, it's still not going to be that big a share of our workforce, because manufacturing is so much more productive now. Um, I was just telling a friend uh, an image from when I was, used to be a business reporter. I visited a new concrete block factory. I was a local business reporter, so this was big news. So I went and wrote a story about it. And I figured it would be a beehive of activity with all kinds of factory workers. And there were like seven people working in the whole place because all they did was push buttons. It was all automated. So the fact is, we live in a society where um, it requires a much higher level of education to be able to earn the kind of wages that you could have supported a family on in earlier years working in, man, in industry or in farming. Well, we're into, we are importing in amount, what amounts to a 19th century workforce into a 21st century society. And these people find jobs. It's not that they're unemployed. It's that they're a mismatch between, there's a mis, they're a mismatch with the kind of modern society we have today. And that has effects both for immigrants and for Native American workers. Immigrants clearly do better than they did in the old country by coming here. And their kids do better than they do. That was true a century ago, it was true two centuries ago, it's true today. But because of the changes in our economy, immigrants arrive much farther behind the starting line, as it were, than they ever did before. It took the Irish a century to catch up with the rest of American society, uh, and that was in a very different world from today. Uh, and, that, and the success of immigrants, and most especially their kids, is something we clearly have a very strong interest in. Once we let in people, the success and thriving of those people is very much in the national interest. And earlier immigrants are arguably the first people who are harmed by ongoing mass immigration. This is a point Raihan Salam made in his book, um, and it's, it's well taken. But also, American workers who are in one way or another marginal to the labor market are harmed by this. Teenagers, recovering addicts, ex-cons, people with physical or mental disabilities, anybody that employers would kind of rather not hire is undermined by the loosening of the labor market that immigration causes. And let me just give you one number on this to kind of put it in context. The National Academies of Sciences did a magisterial look at the cost and benefits, the labor market cost and benefits of immigration uh, several years ago. And they concluded that there was in fact a $50 billion net benefit to the economy from immigration. But that's a net benefit. That net benefit came from $550 billion in increased earnings for those who use immigrant labor, but a $500 billion loss to those workers who are here who compete with immigrants. So you subtract 500 from 550, you get a $50 billion net benefit. So that's nice, except that, number one, it's not very big. 50, I mean, I'll take half that and be satisfied with it, but in a national economy, it's not very much money. Number two, it comes from beggaring the poor. So it's a reverse Robin Hood policy. And number three, and this leads me to the second topic, uh, it is totally wiped out 
by extra social service costs because this only relates to the labor market uh, costs and benefits. And that's the second area where there's a conflict between mass immigration and modern societies, welfare. There was no welfare state a century ago, two centuries ago. There were some small local level private or, or local government uh, efforts at relief, they called it in the old days. But it was nothing like the welfare state we have today. And the fact is that half of households headed by immigrants use at least one federal welfare program. And this is not a moral critique. Nobody in Honduras is rubbing his hands together and saying, boy, I want to get to America and get me some of those EBT cards. No. Immigrants are coming here and they're working. But because they, generally speaking, have a much lower level of education, the jobs they can get pay less, and therefore they end up to be much more likely to qualify for taxpayer-funded, means-tested benefits, i.e. welfare. And even when you look at skilled immigrants and compare them to skilled natives, their use of welfare is less than the unskilled, but is dramatically higher than similarly educated American workers. This is not sustainable, and I'm a conservative. I believe in a tighter welfare a system of social provision for the poor that's less likely to lead to dependency and dysfunction, but it's not going away. Some kind of welfare state is an integral part of modern societies, and immigration is fundamentally incompatible with that. It makes it unsustainable. And the third area of conflict between mass immigration and modern society that I'll touch on is assimilation. And modernity creates problems regarding assimilation in two ways. One is a good development of modernity, one is bad. Let me start with the good one. Modern transportation and communications technology shrinks the world. This is a boon, uh, economically a boon, culturally a boon. How many of us would even be here if we couldn't get on a plane, however um, you know, deficient our airlines might be? Um, you know, it would have taken, it would have taken me what? two months to get here on a horse from Washington? I don't know, but um, you know, this is a positive development. On the other hand, from the perspective of assimilation, it makes it much less likely that an immigrant is going, is going to be forced to reorient his psychological and emotional attachments from one place to the next because he can, in a sense, live in two countries at the same time. Um, nobody could hop on a plane and go to their cousin's wedding in Palermo in 1921 and then hop back here for a four-day weekend, now you can. Um, the other, I'm running out of time here, so the other area where mass, the assimilation problem that modernity creates is something we've been talking about now for a day or day and a half, whatever it is, and that is that our elites are no longer committed to the Americanization or assimilation of newcomers. I mean, we're not even assimilating American kids particularly well, but at least there are kids and from home and, you know, and whatnot, they can learn something about their own country. Immigrant kids, they know nothing. They're coming here with a, mostly a blank slate. My mother, the daughter of immigrants, went to public school outside Boston in the 30s and 40s, and her parents brought her to school, and the implicit deal was, Mr. School, you teach our daughter what it is to be an American. So my mother memorized the Gettysburg Address, sang Hail Columbia, and learned that George Washington was the father of our country. How many people think they're learning that in the LA Unified School District, or in New York schools, or Chicago, or anywhere else? No, they're not. And it's not the immigrant's fault. No immigrant is coming here and saying to the school, please teach my kid to hate her new country. They are taking the cues from us. And until we can fix this, it's simply irresponsible. To, un to continue a policy like we have now, mass immigration. So just quickly, what does that mean as a, in a practical sense? It doesn't mean zero immigration. It means zero-based budgeting in immigration. A vast continental nation with a third of a billion people that invented modernity doesn't need any immigration at all. So you start at zero, but then which categories of people have such a compelling reason to be let in that we let them in anyway? And just very quickly, that would be three groups of people. The biggest one would be husbands, wives, and little kids of American citizens. There's really not any debate that's not particularly controversial. Even after we supposedly shut off immigration in the 20s, spouses and minor children were still able to come in. My uh, maternal grandmother 
came in that way. She married, they arranged it. It was a, you know, one of those arranged marriages. My grandfather and she met in Havana, got married, did the paperwork at the consulate and came here. That's irreducible minimum. But that's 350,000 people a year now, something like that. Second, Einstein's. Everybody agrees that the super top people in the field, best and genuinely best and brightest, are going to be a benefit to the United States. But there's not that many people in the world. Humanity does not create a lot of Einsteins every year. And then finally, humanitarian immigration, refugees and asylum. I can go into detail if anybody wants to ask questions about that, but I've gotten a lot more hardcore on that. There's refugee resettlement is morally wrong because except in the most extreme circumstances, we can do much more good by taking care of people where they are. It costs, our research shows, 12 times as much to bring a refugee here as it does to help take care of them where he is in the region they are. And asylum is a complete scam, as we're seeing at the border, and Brandon will probably tell us a little bit about. If, there's not a single person who passes through Mexico who should even be permitted to apply for asylum given that they went through Mexico, and Mexico is a signatory to the UN refugee treaties, they have an asylum system. Every person who passes through Mexico ignores that process and applies here instead is a fraud. So you add all that together, you still you end up with 350, 400,000 people a year. It's still a lot. It's more than any other country takes in legal immigration, but it's a dramatic reduction, maybe 60, 70 percent less than we take now, and much less likely to create a lot of the problems we're seeing that mass immigration creates for us today. Thanks.